Now, the reason I didn't read out your biography, Stefano, apologies, I didn't, I didn't refer to who you work for, is because your biography is so long and so uh, deep that I can hardly do justice to it as you were walking up on stage. You're a former Italian internet, you're a pioneer of the internet infrastructure in Italy and digital transformation, parliamentarian, former chairman of the steering committee at Agenzia per Italia Digitale, and founder of Rialto Venture Capital. So you have this extraordinary insight into the history of how this challenge of identifying people, of attaching an identity to somebody in terms of remote transaction has developed over time. Can you please share with the audience some of your experience in terms of founding an ISP and then becoming the de facto leader of the development of digital identity in Italy, and then a leadership role across Europe in leading now to EIDAS as it currently is. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Well, uh, well, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yes, I, I founded the first ISP in Italy in, in mid-90s, and... Uh, Matter of, Matter of Life brought me to uh, a think tank in, in Berlin. You probably know Giseke and De Vrindt, the company that makes, actually makes the money <laughs> and the paper for passwords, etc. They had a, a, a CEO who came from Philips and uh, he said, well, we are in the trust business and what happens when trust is going to be digitized because our trust is based on paper. And, and he built this think tank, and I was part of that, and it was about 2008 when we started, so some 15, 16 years ago. And, and we were starting this discussing about the future of trust and the future of identity in the digital space. Then eventually I got to the Italian parliament. Uh, you know, in Italy we had a, a technical government run by former Commissioner Monti, and he asked me to, to, to to enter the parliament, and when, when, I, when I arrived, I proposed uh, to build uh, uh, a, what we call the digital identity infrastructure in Italy, which is SPEED now. It's a system used by uh, 36 million people, 39 million people right now, a couple billion of times a year, and so it's heavily successful. And I had the chance of contributing some ideas to the debate on EIDAS uh, in, in, in Europe. So that, that's pretty much my <laughs> the, the history, how, how I got involved with this. And, uh, and, and some of the things that have been discussed today, well, we, need, we needed to face them. I mean, finding the right balance between security and usability and where to put that level of friction and to have ex ante or ex post controls and audits, et cetera. It's, it's a delicate recipe. I mean, it's putting in ingredients together in a very delicate way and finding a, a, the right balance. And I must say I'm quite satisfied. I mean, having 39 million people using it a couple of billion times a year, it's quite a, quite a success story. Well, when you reflect upon the amount of time you spent working and fostering and leading this to where we are now, are we now at the place you expected us to be when you began this work? Are we ahead of schedule? And how does the work that we're talking about in Europe compared to the quality of work done elsewhere in the world. So is, even if we're maybe not where you want us to be, are we ahead of where other parts of the world are? Well, you know, different parts of the world have different values. And, and, and when you come to values, you need to, to decide on, what, on what, which values you are going to build uh, your systems because systems are going to reflect the values. Uh, take elections now in the US mm. and they have the issue of registering people to, to vote because they, it's not mandatory to have a, 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 an ID in, in the States. So there is not even the concept of an, of an ID. The, the, um, I was talking with the US government a couple of years ago, some years ago, and they had this issue that the, um, the social security number, which is just the code, 
was regarded as a as a, an identity pointer, and uh, and we, and was kept secret, and you had no way of uh, identifying people across different systems because the only reference they had is this is, is like having a username and and not a password, mm -hmm. and, and and you cannot have a, possibly a key between different databases. So different different places have different values. You don't have the obligation of having a, an, a, a registered identity in some countries and some nations. It's uh, it's a very complicated. So, in my view, we are not referring also to what was said before. We are not going to have a global solution on these things. So, the the, the values in India are very different than the values in China and in the uh, and in, in, in the U.S. and in Europe. Hopefully, in Europe we have a large enough market and. Uh, we are now standardizing a, a new version of, of, we have standardized a new version of digital identity which will bring significant benefits to the industries, all industries, and, and hopefully it's going to be exported somewhere, not everywhere because of the different values at the basis of the different societies. Thank you for that. Now, Bryn, I'll bring you in now. You have also a fabulous CV, but a different kind of background to most of us in the room. Your background, HSBC, Barclays, the UK Post Office, MasterCard, you have a lot of experience, understanding of the financial sector. And obviously you're at this intersection now, which is why you're here with us in the room today with this experience in connecting these services, which are also global and they're connected to these global networks, to this question which you, you challenge, this challenge you deal with on behalf of iProve, which is product strategy for digital identity. It may seem like a simple question, but can you kind of put, a, uh, can you get your hands around the scale and the importance of the problem in terms of why it's so important that the interface that we have with our financial service providers when it's online, why this, we must get the identity right? Uh, so, great question. And um, just picking up on a uh, comment that Stefano made about the different attitudes to, uh, to identity. So, one of the companies that uh, I worked for um, is the UK Post Office, and that's where my journey in identity started. And not digital identity, but identity. Mm. Um, so the UK was going to have a national identity card, and that was kind of like, <laughs> you know, we, we haven't had those since wartime. You know, why, why would we have them? We're not at war. And uh, that, that's where my journey started, and I was looking at the enrollment of citizens into the identity scheme, so people would come into the post office to have their photo taken, get their fingerprints done, do their signature to get their card produced. And as part of that program, government were on a digital by default program, so trying to uh, be more digital in how it interacted with citizens. And so, great, we'll have this identity card and we can have chip readers and people can uh, stick their card in their chip reader on their computer and then we'll know that it's them. Mm. And then 2008, we had a change of government and the first thing that the government did was to scrap the national identity card scheme, which kind of put a bit of a kibosh on how to then transform digital government. So that's where I then moved into digital identity and working with the government around principles for digital identity. So how you can get privacy, how you can get security, how you can get usability and setting those out as principles to build the digital identity system from. In terms of then the financial sector, so the financial sector have a lot of similarities for why they need to do um, identity as to the mobile industry do. Mm. So is it regulatory compliance? So do we have to do something? Are we compelled by our regulator to identify our customers? Mm. And in a lot of cases, in a lot of services, the answer is yes. We've spent this morning talking about fraud prevention. And again, that's common across the financial sector and the mobile industry as well. 
And then there's consumer protection. So ultimately, we're there to serve our consumers, to keep them safe from those frauds, from financial fraud, from being conned out of their money, to being signed up for uh, services that they haven't signed up for, um, from being told that, well, you, you took out a contract that came with the latest iPhone. What do you mean it wasn't you that did it? So that consumer protection really comes into it as well. And what we also need to think about as organizations is our brand reputation. Because if we don't get these things right, mm -hmm. it's our brand that gets damaged. It's the confidence from our consumers in us as organizations that gets damaged. And we've had evidence of that within the mobile industry. So we've had, in the UK, um, talk, talk. Um, we're subject to data breach. Um, we're subject to two data breaches. Um, so having just about recovered from the first one, there was then a second one. And that uh, to be fair, though, other telcos have had data breaches too. Indeed. Um, and in, in Australia, um, Optus had one uh, just um, just a couple of uh, years back. And again, it was a big impact on them, and it was a big impact on their consumers as well. So the data that gets leaked, it's our sensitive personal data, and it then goes on to fuel other fraud. Well, but, I mean, let's just examine the Australian example there, just briefly, because you brought it up. That did lead to a positive change, in the sense that there was this immediate push for the exchange of intelligence between the financial sector and the telecommunications sector. So there's a very quick rewrite of the rules in Australia. So that could be seen as a perhaps a template for like improving things. Uh, something bad did lead to something good in terms of... Um, absolutely it did. I mean, it, it would be better if we got to the good <laughs> without the bad happening. But, but yeah, sure, we, we did get there. But I think that... What it, what it has done is it's changed our attitudes to actually what information we need to collect from um, consumers. So if I've got my driver's license, the mobile network operators and the banks used to do the same would stick it on the photocopier and take a copy of it. There's no reason why they need to do that in today's age yeah. in the digital world. And that's really where things like EIDAS come in. Um, so I've sat here all morning listening to uh, TLAs um, of the uh, mobile industry, going, what does that stand for? So um, let me just explain EIDAS, uh, just to uh, um, really make things complicated. It's a five-letter acronym, and it's also an acronym that's not related to uh, the, the words that it stands for. So it's the EU regulation on electronic identification and trust services. So how we identify people and um, the services around them, signing documents, signing transactions, that all fits within the IDAS regulation. But what the IDAS regulation does is it creates a legal certainty around an identity. So it means that I don't need to know the underlying how that identity was formed I can trust the fact that when Bryn presents his identity, if it's done to the EIDAS regulation and it's certified, then I can trust that it's Bryn. And I, I only have to store the transaction record that I got. I don't need to store the passport, the driver's license, the national identity card, the inside leg measurement that went up to form that identity. Great stuff. Across, across all Europe. Uh, uh, if I may add something, uh, when you design an identity system, very early when we started in building the, the Italian digital identity infrastructure in 2013, uh, we were facing uh, uh, the issue whether to build a centralized system or a federated system. And there is one, one more complication that you don't think of when you are uh, even a citizen or, or a company. And it, that, that's the, 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 the issue of power. Uh, I mean, if you build a centralized system that governs the possibility of access of people to digital services, that in the future means everything, you are building an 
uh, an infrastructure of massive power controlled by the elected representative of that minister in mm -hmm. that specific period of time. And, and, uh, and this can be a nightmare scenario. I mean, in terms of digital warfare or, 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 or worse, mm -hmm. democratic crisis, etc. So that's why we decided to have a federated system instead. And, uh, uh, and that's one, one added layer of complication when you think of the systems that you need, you need to balance also democratic principles because you know you build safeguards against the bad times when when you don't when you are in good times but when you are in good times you don't perceive the need of, of those things you know so it's uh, it's a very what i was mentioning before not delicate uh, equilibrium of different ingredi ingredients one of these is a, a, a democratic consideration on how to preserve uh, uh, the function of, of, of the states preventing a bad actor to, to, to take advantage of those. Think of the, of the level of control that somebody can have if he runs a, a digital ID infrastructure or just the revocation lists now. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. Sorry, I just wanted to, to, to add this to the previous point. I think, you know, we applauded the wisdom involved there to anticipate and to look ahead in terms of being federated to address specifically that problem. No, it was it was really a, a, a strong discussion within within the government because people say, "Well, we are the government; people trust us." Yes, but people trust you now. What about in thirty year time? Mm. I mean, you need to think uh, you need to think of the possible things that can go wrong in in, in the state in thirty years time: a crisis, virus, or whatever. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, how does this connect to self-sovereign ID and the driving force behind that? As a matter of fact, uh, when I was involved in, in giving some advice to the, the second release of the IDAS regulation, with the first release of the IDAS regulation, each member state could build the system pretty much like they wanted, but they had to share with the other, because you know, the, the, the all the, the, the identity credentials are recognized across all, all Europe. And, and the digital signatures, et cetera. But so uh, uh, a digital identity credential, a digital recogn identity recognition at the station made in Italy is recognized in Denmark. So you need to agree with, other, with, with the other place around Europe, with other peers around Europe. And um, uh, so in, in the first release of the IDAS regulation, Every country could build the system pretty much like they wanted. So somebody went after smart cards. In, in Italy, we did not go after smart cards. We relied on, on mobile phones, maybe, mainly. And uh, I mean, there were different systems. And then there was a network of interoperability points, so to allow the interoperability between the states. Now, in the second release of EIDAS, we have, uh, uh, we have, changed, the, we have changed the system now. And we have moved uh, in a direction similar to digital, uh, to uh, self sovereign identity, uh, which is, of course, is not self. I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the assurance, of, um, the level of assurance is guaranteed by the state, mm -hmm. and that gives the legal certainty for businesses to be able to use the system uh, without fearing any, uh, any consequences. And, uh, but the idea is to use digital certificates instead of, for example, SAML, SAML, like we use in Italy in, in the first release. And, and, and digital certificates give another layer of, uh, of it improves the, the, the security uh, and, uh, and the privacy of the system. So tech, there are delicate balances, and these balances move because the technology evolves. And as technology evolves, uh, you can use different systems. So I don't think that this is the latest release uh, uh, of the, the digital identity technology in Europe is going to evolve as technology evolves uh, and we are going to face new challenges. Think, for example, quantum computers breaking uh, <laughs> asymmetric keys, for example. We need to, 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 to change technology again in a couple of years. But, I mean, I mean it's interesting. You need to, to, to balance a lot of things. It's like cooking a good dish. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting business. So where are we exactly with EIDAS 2.0, the second version of EIDAS? Where we are now, uh, 
it has been approved in spring this year. And they had six months' time to build the technical rules, which were mostly ready. There are some minor details still to be ironed out, but in, in two years' time, it's going to be mandatory for telco operators, for financial institutions, for healthcare, etc., to uh, uh, accept uh, uh, digital identities across uh, across all Europe. So we are we are not really going to migrate previous digital identity systems in, uh, across Europe to the to the new schema, and that will take at, it, it will end in two years' time. So this migration phase is going to end in two years' time. Now it's not all not I mean it's not all good news. Uh, there are some critical aspects, uh, but I hope that very very minor details that I hope that are going to be ironed out in this with the, with the next uh, commission. I think that we are going to have some tiny adjustments to the rules, but I'm not going into much details about that. Yeah. And so, Bryn, with with this evolution that's taking place with the EIDAS 2.0, is it happening at the right pace to deal with the scale of fraud that financial service providers are having to deal with? Is there a degree of tension that more things need to be done as well to kind of close the gap with all this emphasis? We saw the statistics earlier on, UK 40% of crime is a fraud and 1% of police resources. Are the changes being made here that we're talking about now that Stefano is outlining, are they keeping pace with where we need to be in terms of protecting bank customers, other customers for services? So one of, one of the big changes between EIDAS 1 and EIDAS 2, EIDAS 1, it compelled public service organisations to um, have mutual recognition across Europe, so you had to recognise other states' identities as you recognise your own. What EIDAS 2 does, as Stefano mentioned, is it brings what they call essential services into scope as well in the private sector, and that includes opening a bank account, um, strong customer authentication for payments. It brings telcos into scope as well. It brings large platforms into scope as well. So the, the EIDAS 2 regulation, because it's got that private sector aspect to it, and it's mandating the recognition and the acceptance of that, it has quite rightly got um, particularly banks um, looking at what's happening and saying, well, how does this work for us? Or actually take, taking a fairly common approach um, when, when a regulator, when a, um, when a new regulation comes into force of saying, well, you, you figure it out, and then when you've figured it out, then come and talk to us. But that's not what the regulation's saying. The regulation says that by May 2026, um, every member state will offer a digital wallet um, to their citizens and to businesses as well. And that's at the point when um, the ecosystem needs to be stood up. So I think that the, the reaction from the financial sector is, is understandable. It's, it's not all sorted out yet. There's still lots going on in, in the implementation phase. There's large-scale pilots looking at how it will actually work in practice. I think the banks have got rightful concerns over the authentication methods. So banks have spent the last 20 years protecting their online banking, their mobile banking, and now something else is coming along that they haven't got that visibility on. What's the concerns? Come on, elaborate, please. So um, one, one of the big challenges, and I'm not just saying this because I work for a biometric company, um, one of the big challenges is the lack of biometric authentication in the system. Um, so if you've got your credential in your wallet and your wallet's protected by your six-digit pin, then if you put your six-digit pin in, then, hey, it must be Britain. Mm, mm. We know that, that that's not the reality of how things work, and the banks are rightly concerned um, that that's not strong enough for them. It's not got the transaction monitoring that they've got around their own authentication. It doesn't use biometrics, or it doesn't mandate the use of biometrics. No, moreover, there are con uh, conflicting regulations between EIDAS and uh, European Central Bank, uh, for example, mandating the fact that the whole biometric 
uh, process must be under the control of the bank. So we, that, that's one of the details I was mentioning that needs to be ironed out. But, but we have time. I mean, I'm optimistic. Biometrics are going to come to digital wallets. That, that, that's for sure. Um, what does that mean for people who are maybe already underbanked? There's always poor people in every country. And there's still people who use feature phones. So uh, how can you address this and then potentially leave some people that you may also be wanting to serve as customers out the loop? Not everybody has a smartphone. Not everybody wants to use a smartphone. Absolutely. And, and also, not everyone wants to use digital services either. So I think from a very fundamental level, we've got to make sure that we have non-digital services and that as digital services become easier, cheaper, faster, that we don't ignore the fact that people do need support, we do need physical locations for people to go to. In terms of the smartphone versus feature phone, um, if you look in countries like Africa, um, it's down to network coverage, it's down to the availability of power, it's down to education. So there's lots of factors. It's not just a smartphone versus feature phone. But I think that what we, what we do need to make sure um, within the European Union is that we've also got non-smartphone solutions as well. So be that a kiosk where people can go and authenticate themselves and then do their transactions whether it works on a desktop or a laptop, so shared infrastructure as well. Whilst it's absolutely right to go mobile first, because we have got 60% penetration um, at least um, in, uh, in the places where we need it, but really we need to think about those other, other solutions. We need to make sure that inclusion's at the heart of what we're doing as well. Because, mm. no, of course, you know, something like central bank digital currencies can kind of generate a lot of heat in terms of certain sections of society, seeing that in a very negative light. But is it inevitable that Europe is going to have to encourage the populace to use digital identities more for their own benefit and for their own protection? Sorry, I didn't get it. Sorry, say it again. Is it inevitable that in Europe yeah. that the government will need to encourage people to make better use, to be more, uh, more accepting of digital identities for their own benefit, for their own uh, safety? I, I, I don't think that we are going to need a, a significant push. I mean, I see what has happened in Italy, and it's uh, people recognize the benefit, the possibility of doing things that you normally had to do going to an office, to a public office, and instead you do it at 11 p.m. in your bed. I mean, the convenience is there, so people use it. And, and the fact of migrating transaction to, to, to digital, if you look to what is happening in China, where 93% of transactions are, are made by two companies, 7.7300 7, million uh, dollars transaction every year, and that, that, that is going to happen. I mean. We are leaders in some aspects, we are followers in other, and the combination of the two, that, that is going to happen. I don't, I don't think we are going to need a significant push. Push will be, but because you know, when you go to the private sector, the private sector is going, is going to drive the adoption because you have significant benefits, benefits in terms of bridging the analog gap you have when you need to take, uh, to, to intake uh, data from a user data that is going to be in the wallet and it's going to be provided uh, digitally so you don't have to correct that so you're going to it's going to be more precise i mean it's going to cost less the, the process is going to cost significantly less there are going to be very few errors i mean there are a number of situations that is going to drive the, the adoption by the private sector and and the private sector will push adoption to the user so i don't think that we need a specific push for the government we must make people trust the system mm -hmm. the, the, this is the key if if that if you don't trust the system it's going to be a disaster and understanding that there are going to be frauds nevertheless because <laughs> nothing is perfect and that's normal and you have to address the, the those frauds and those negative exceptions and and build trust and confidence that is something that that governments can can help, but not in, in the push of, of usage, in my view. Fabulous answer, and I've really enjoyed the conversation. I would have kept on talking, we've run, oh, do we have time for one quick question?
No, it's not on. Fine. Okay. Um, I'm curious, uh, what do you think is the opportunity for uh, businesses that want to become identity providers for under EIDAS? Um, and what do you think is the chance of success for businesses to provide to become identity providers? Like the post office could be, right? Like, or, or whoever else. Um, I was reading your Wikipedia page, uh, Stefano, and I know you proposed a law for device neutrality. Uh, but the reality is that the big platforms, um, Apple and Google, have a tremendous power. And the reason why they have a tremendous power is because they um, control the customer experience well and they can embed potentially EI that's compliant, in my view, services uh, extremely well and in a very user-friendly way. So the question is, on the light of that, um, what do you think is the opportunity for businesses to to actually you know succeed in becoming identity providers hmm. <laughs> so uh, first of all mm, you know apple and google really want to keep a very strong hold of their domains but you know that uh, Apple has been forced to give access to the NFC chip for other companies. And that is something that I didn't expect to happen. Uh, so there are going to be competitive, uh, a competition of actors in the wallet space and invading what is presently the, the domain uh, of Apple and Google. So there is going to be somebody building, I don't know, Barclays, building a digital wallet with a direct access to the NFC chip and being able to provide a wallet for payments, etc. Indeed, Google and Apple are going to be first competitor in this. I don't think that there is presently a business case uh, for digital identity per se. During the, the, the um, the process in the parliament in EIDAS II, the parliament approved the fact that digital signature and digital identity shall be free for all European citizens. Uh, I'm no longer in, in uh, I'm a venture capitalist right now, but I, I got a number of calls by some friends and I tried to, to discuss with some MPs, etc. I tried to say, listen, somebody needs to pay this. If something is free, then the service goes to those who can provide it as a, with a marginal cost, uh, and basically that is going to be Google and Apple. Furthermore, the, the regulation says that uh, each member state must have their own uh, uh, certified solution, and that solution can be done by the state, but done by somebody designated by the state or by the third party and authorized by the state. And it doesn't say that this third party needs to be European. So indeed, uh, we are going to have EIDAS wallets by Google and Apple. And they are going to be to become dominant. And, and then go dominant because they're going to tie it to the operating system and you're going to find it pre-installed and then you're going to, somebody is going to file, to, to file an antitrust case and in several, seven year times we are going to have a decision and the decision is going to be appealed and in 12 year times they'll say, okay, you pay one billion fine and who cares? Uh, uh, <laughs> that, 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 is, that is likely what is going to happen. So I don't think there is a, a business around uh, digital identity because of this decision of, of the parliament. Uh, it would have been different if they say, okay, market forces drive the things. It would, have, it would have been different if if the regulation said that European companies, that the wallets might be, must be provided by European companies, but that is not, did not happen. Uh, so... Uh, if, I, if I could just add a, a slightly different perspective, I, I do agree with a, with a lot of what you said, but what I think that you will find from member states' perspective is that whilst they've got to provide the core identity credential, 
to open a bank account, you need more than just name and date of birth. And that's, that's the added space where you can create value. That's where I was going to, uh, to, to enter. Around the core identity, the basic data, there is not going to be a business. The business is going to be a debt about data enrichment of the, data, uh, of the basic data. But of course, again, Google and Apple are going to play in this space. Google is now providing AML as a service, for example. So it's going, we're, we're, I mean, we are going into interesting yeah. times. Well, they've, they've also both got a, uh, a history of not wanting to be a regulated entity, though. So. Apple Cash is provided by a bank. Apple Card is provided by a bank. So there, there will be an opportunity within the wallet to actually be the certified entity. So it may be that I decide to set up my company doing university calls in Belgium. And that's, that's my business. But I can put that credential into an Apple wallet and get the distribution and get the network effect from that. So I think that there, there are new business models that will form, and they'll form over the next five to 10 years. Thank you for such fascinating insight. I'm sure there's more questions, but we have to wrap up now. Great round of applause, please, for Stefano and Bryn. <laughs>